It's extremely hard to come to terms with the idea that the last 20 years of marriage were full of lies and you lived with the most terrible person. That's exactly what I came across. But the most interesting thing is how I found out about my wife's infidelity. My wife was an extremely intelligent and cold-blooded woman who paid attention to every little thing, but she missed one detail, an unreliable lover. Had I been aware that today would mark the final ordinary day in my life for several months ahead, I might have been more inclined to pause and appreciate the simple pleasures. Around 3 Cala p.m., my secretary entered my office to inform me of a visitor. Rising from my desk, I approached as she ushered him in, but he disregarded my extended hand. Well, he disregarded it in terms of a handshake. Instead, he seized the opportunity presented by my posture to thrust an A4 envelope into it, uttering the words, You've been served. I might have been rendered speechless by the shock, but I'm not ignorant. I've read plenty of stories about unfaithful wives, so I thought I understood what was happening. The typical narrative, a wife falls for someone else, loses interest in her husband, and carries on clandestine affairs. She schemes, plots, and ultimately betrays until the unsuspecting husband is blindsided. I just couldn't fathom that it could be happening with my wife. Sure, after nearly 25 years of marriage, we weren't consumed with the passionate love we once had. But who is, after being together for so long? I believed, however, that our initial infatuation had evolved into a deep respect and a comfortable companionship. I thought our fiery passion had matured into a steady, comforting warmth. I assumed she found fulfillment as the non-working spouse of a successful businessman, taking pride in her involvement in various church groups, serving as the chairwoman of our local school board, and participating in numerous other community events. I gazed down at the envelope, bewildered, pondering its significance. However, no explanation presented itself. There had been no indications that she was displeased with me. She knew me well enough to understand that if she had any concerns, she could approach me calmly and discuss them. While I had noticed a slight anxiety in her demeanor over the past few days, she had not shown any signs of intending to sever ties abruptly. Furthermore, it wasn't as if she suspected me of having an extramarital affair and was using our recent empty nest situation as a pretext to end our relationship. I have always been faithful to my wife, adhering steadfastly to our marriage vows, despite occasional admiration from others. Even during my extensive solo travels, opportunities for infidelity have arisen, but I have never entertained them. I quickly dismissed this possibility, knowing well the consequences of betraying my wife's trust, especially given her renowned temper. If she ever caught me being unfaithful, retribution would be swift and severe. I came to the realization that I was putting off facing the moment when my world would officially crumble. Despite acknowledging this, I found myself lingering as I stared at the envelope. Eventually, after taking a deep breath, I tore it open and extracted a thick stack of papers. Relief flooded me as I read the header. It wasn't the anticipated petition for the dissolution of marriage, but rather something else I was being sued for. I mentally scolded myself for doubting my wife's love and fidelity, resolving to buy her a lavish bouquet of flowers on my way home, and perhaps treat her to a fancy dinner. Still trembling with relief, I circled my desk and sank into my chair to thoroughly read through the document. To my disbelief, it wasn't the business facing the lawsuit as I had expected, but rather our homeowner's insurance policy. I was being sued on behalf of someone named Simon Rogers, who had apparently fallen down my stairs four days prior and was still hospitalized due to serious injuries. The accompanying letter explained that I was being sued for medical expenses, loss of income, and pain and suffering. Suffice it to say, the amount being sought was substantial enough to sustain a small third world country for a considerable period. I reclined in my chair while examining the statements accompanying the letter from Simon's lawyer, feeling somewhat puzzled by the situation. From the statements, I gleaned only three key points. To begin with, Mr. Simon Rogers had been visiting my wife, Jennifer Brown, at the time of the accident which involved him falling down the stairs after tripping on a protruding nail on the top landing. Secondly, this incident occurred on a day when I was out of town. And lastly, the incident took place at 5 a.m., just before dawn at this time of year. 
I reclined further in my chair, reminiscing about the layout of my house. There was just one staircase across the property, leading from the ground floor to the first, connecting the living areas to the bedrooms. All the bedrooms were situated upstairs, with a downstairs toilet eliminating the need to use the upstairs bathrooms. Once again, I was rendered speechless. In the span of ten minutes, I had transitioned from suspecting my wife of infidelity to feeling embarrassed and remorseful for not trusting her, only to now comprehend the truth. Some unfamiliar man had fallen down the stairs from the bedrooms in the early hours of the morning while my wife was home, supposedly alone. Or so I had thought. The recent memory of accusing Jennifer of cheating, which I now realized was unjust, halted any further contemplation for the time being. I required concrete information, and a document indicated the hospital where I could find the answers. Informing my secretary of my absence for the remainder of the day, I made my way to the hospital, stopping to pick up a fruit basket along the way. By the time I reached the hospital, my intense emotions had subsided, at least temporarily. During visiting hours, the nurses at the station were helpful in directing me to the appropriate ward. Inside, I found a room with space for two occupants, but only one person present. I activated the voice recorder app on my phone, concealed it in my shirt pocket, and proceeded to open the door. From what I could discern beneath the layers of bandages, traction devices, and plaster casts, Simon Rogers appeared significantly younger, taller, more muscular, and fitter than myself. Upon my entrance into his room, he cast a casual glance my way, momentarily puzzled, before his eyes widened in recognition or realization. I leaned toward the former, judging by his vacant expression suggesting limited intellect, and considering the numerous family photos adorning the house. With what could only be described as the slowest attempt at reaching, he aimed for the nurse call button. Despite the pain it likely caused him, his efforts were in vain. I had already reached it a good two minutes prior and placed it strategically beyond his grasp. He now understood the reason for my presence and realized his own helplessness. I deliberately allowed my gaze to linger slowly over all the wires and devices restraining him, which we both knew served as instruments of torture. He cast one more longing glance at the nurse call button, well out of his reach, and mentally surrendered. I'm sorry, man. Truly sorry. What do you need to know? How long have you been having an affair with my wife, Jenny Brown? About six months, he confessed softly. I was taken aback. Six months, and I had no idea. It coincided well with our empty nest, though. Who initiated it? I did. I'm the janitor at the school where she serves on the board. An embarrassed expression crossed his face. I have a... Thing for older women, you know. Especially ones as attractive as your wife, I mean. He halted his speech abruptly as my hand seized one of the wires connected to his leg. He pleaded with his eyes, realizing he had said too much. How long did it take from when you started pursuing her to when you slept with her? About two weeks, I suppose. Yeah, about two weeks. I remained quiet. With certain individuals, it's often best to cease speaking and allow them to continue, filling the uneasy silence. He clearly belonged to that category. I mean, she made it clear she was interested right away, then it took another week or so for her to communicate and enforce her boundaries, and then, well, yes? Another week for you to leave town on business. Finally, he ceased rambling, and in the ensuing silence, I settled on my next question. You mentioned rules earlier. Yeah, man, she had a whole list of them. About 20 rules I couldn't break. There was one... Wait, pass me my phone. She texted them to me so I wouldn't forget any. I handed him his phone from the bedside table. He unlocked it, located the text conversation, scrolled to near the top, and passed it to me. The first thing I noticed was that the number the text originated from wasn't my wife's regular number. A burner phone, I suspected, likely kept in the safe to which I didn't have the combination. The safe the school insisted she keep me from seeing inside of. Here are Jenny's guidelines, meticulously articulated in her unique manner. Avoid any public displays of affection or even acknowledging each other's presence in public. If you happen to notice me at school, just keep walking. Before our first meeting, you must provide me with a recent clear STD test. 
Our communication will strictly include intimacy, devoid of any emotional attachment. No kissing or expressions of love. We will meet exclusively at my house when my husband leaves for a business trip for the night, and only after I confirm his location. I prefer that he does not call the landline in my absence, as this may require some complicated explanations. That's why during my business trips I was expected to dial our home landline from the hotel phone between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. Jenny's rationale for insisting on a landline call? She believed that extended conversations on cell phones were associated with the risk of brain cancer. You will consistently provide and use condoms. Each time, you'll bring a new, sealed box of five. Five? Wow! When was the last time we made love five times in one session? Has this ever happened? I looked at the man lying on the bed, wrapped in bandages and immobilized. Who was he? By car. I kept on reading. I'll watch you break the seal and make sure you throw away all five, whether they were used or not, before you leave. I'll have to keep an eye on every package before you wash them. Don't forget that, please. Relief washed over me, but it made me feel sick. I was disgusted to read all this. It was as if I was reading the instructions for use of some cheap Chinese toy. Phew. The mention of the five condom rule caught my attention, prompting me to familiarize myself with the rules once again. Everything was very competently compiled so that the hubby did not suspect anything. Apparently, she studied enough information about cheating wives and took into account all the banal and popular mistakes. Hmm. Clever. As I continued reading, the text seemed frighteningly methodical, resembling a checklist for planning a vacation or shopping rather than a passionate exchange of opinions between potential lovers. You're to park your car at the supermarket's parking lot three blocks away from my place. I'll notify you of the earliest acceptable arrival time, which will be at least an hour after nightfall. You'll then proceed on foot from the parking lot and enter through the back gate, where I'll leave a door unlocked for you. Should there be anyone in the lane behind the house, you'll simply keep walking. Departure should be at least an hour before dawn, following the same route. In case we oversleep, I'll provide instructions on when and how to leave. If I decide to end things, you must agree to immediately cease all contact with me. Any objection at that time will result in the guarantee of losing your current job within the week. I quickly looked through about a dozen more minor rules, then returned the phone to him. But before that, I copied and sent all these rules to my phone. Wow. Very comprehensive. Very logical. But a little detached. Didn't it bother you a bit, boy? I said. Yes, too detached. I told her that affection and intimacy are important to me in a relationship. She said we wouldn't have a relationship, just intimacy, you know. It was a complex deal, agree or disagree. And so, somehow. And yet, six months later, you're here. So you couldn't refuse? Yes, well, your wife is pretty convincing. I sent her a no deal message. And the next day, she showed up in the school basement, where my workshop is located, and locked the door behind her. She said something like, are a few rules worth giving up on? Then she took off her top clothes, came up to me and started, you know, he waved his hand vaguely, do your thing. Or this, she said, sitting on the table I was fixing. I was quickly amazed and couldn't help myself. She was very attractive. And judging by her, I wouldn't say she had two children. I felt incredibly disgusted by what he was telling me, but I quickly suppressed this feeling. I did not say that Jenny required two Caesarean sections from a top-notch Sergione, explaining to me at the time that this was done to keep her tout and minimize a scaring. She's completely hairless, as you must know, Simon remarked, looking somewhat ashamed, but still unable to hide the enthusiasm in his tone. And, uh, she obviously needed this dude very badly. I mean, it gave away her assertiveness very much. Once again, I had to suppress my disgust at hearing my wife described in derogatory terms. Even though he portrayed her, she may have fit that description. But decades of love are not easy to ignore. When I hesitated to comply with her demands, she resorted to her latest tactic. How about this? She reached into her purse and pulled out a toy. 
and what happened next, I've never watched live in my life, only if on all sorts of sites for adults, if you understand me, old man. This revelation struck me deeply and I recoiled in response. I'm sorry, man. I'm really sorry. But, well, in any case, nothing happened that day. I tried to approach her, but she pushed me away, got dressed, said, You know the rules. I'll write it. Then she left. Two days later, I got a call, and we had our first session. All this information left me speechless. It was hard to believe that he was describing the person I thought of as his wife, Jenny, the very woman who was extremely conservative about intimacy. Desperate, I sent another question. Where is Jenny's tattoo, and what is depicted on it? I couldn't believe my ears when he told me the exact location of her tattoo and what she looked like. I should note that this tattoo was in the place where only I should have seen it, and no one else. I already felt that my marriage was over long before I went to the hospital, but I didn't have enough evidence to determine the extent of its breakdown. I looked at Simon. Despite his youth and love of life, Jenny's intellect was clearly superior to his. How could she even start a conversation with him? Oh, that's right. She only wanted physical intimacy from him. It bothered me. I couldn't understand it. It's been ages since I've received any sexual attention from my wife. And when I once suggested trying something new, the atmosphere at home turned cold for a few weeks. Nevertheless, I insisted. And you were constantly using protection? I suddenly decided to ask. At first, about a month. Later, she suggested that if I had tests every four weeks, we could do without it. She seemed to like it. I have to say, she was very enthusiastic about it, and that's what we did. I stood in silence, feeling a wave of sickness as I processed the revelation that my wife was not the person I had believed her to be. Wisely, Simon chose to remain quiet as well. Minutes passed before I could gather my thoughts to form my next question. How frequently? Every time you were out of town, I suppose. Two or three times on each trip, except when your youngest child was home during school holidays. Damn. That could have been at least a dozen occasions in total. Unwanted images attempted to invade my mind, but I resisted, knowing there would be time to confront them later. Why take legal action against me and expose everything? Shouldn't Medicare cover all expenses? This attorney showed up the day after I regained consciousness from my induced coma. He mentioned that Medicare would only cover the essentials. A basic wheelchair if I'm unable to walk again. No assistance if I'm left disabled. His voice quivered as he spoke those words, and tears welled up in his eyes. Indeed, he might have been enduring significant consequences for engaging in an affair with my wife. She told me that if I sued you, I'd be financially secure for life. Plus, I've used up all my sick days. Why is that? Jenny would keep me awake all night at times. It was as if she didn't have a shut-off switch. I was frequently too exhausted to go to work, so I called in sick. I soaked in that newly revealed repulsive piece of information. Who was she? The one who gave birth to my children? But in order to sue me, you have to demonstrate negligence on my part. Yeah, I believe I stumbled over a protruding nail on the top step. I had noticed it previously and offered to hammer it in, but Jenny refused, saying it might indicate that someone capable of fixing things had been there. I silently acknowledged my wife's intelligence, though I was a bit perplexed. Jenny had requested me to hammer in that nail last month, and I had complied. They say, happy wife, happy life. But I hadn't fully grasped just how happy she was. Does she know you're suing me? As far as I'm aware, no. When I fell down the stairs, she called an ambulance and remained anxious throughout their presence. I overheard her telling a neighbor she thought I was hit by a car near your place and called for help. She didn't accompany me in the ambulance, and I haven't had any contact with her since. We continued our conversation for another 20 minutes until the nurse entered and administered some pain medication. After he took them, I genuinely wished him a speedy recovery. His vow to avoid involvement with married women in the future seemed sincere to me. I, too, had been young, foolish, and driven by desires at one point in my life. 
Thankfully, I've outgrown youth. I still had an hour before my usual return home time, so I decided to drive to my favorite local park after picking up a high-quality cigar from the nearby tobacconist. Despite Jenny's disapproval of my smoking habit in my current state of mind, I couldn't care less about her opinion. I found a bench in the park, lit the cigar, and thoroughly enjoyed the moment. From now on, I resolved to prioritize my own desires over constantly catering to others' wishes. Simon's revelations shed light on why Jenny appeared so anxious and reluctant to discuss certain matters. When I returned from the trip, she had reluctantly shared the story about the ambulance, but I realized she must be living in fear of neighbors revealing more about Simon's accident and her secrets. With that concern addressed, I contemplated the state of my marriage. It didn't take long for me to conclude that it was beyond repair. This realization was oddly freeing and allowed me to strategize my next steps. While I'm no legal expert, I'm aware that divorce proceedings will likely entail a significant financial settlement to sever ties with Jenny and maintain her accustomed lifestyle. It's unfair, but I understand that's how the family court operates. I won't be the first husband to endure such a fate, nor the last. I wouldn't physically harm her, not necessarily out of any ethical principle, but simply because she wasn't worth risking imprisonment for. Considering what she had done not only to me but also to our family, she wasn't even worth acknowledging. So the only option left in my mind was to humiliate her. I wanted to reciprocate some of the hurt I felt from Simon's revelations. Jenny's social status was everything to her. In the past, I found it amusing, and I always accommodated her. I never criticized or mocked her, as I've never cared about others' opinions of me. Depending on others' acceptance and approval seemed like a form of self-enslavement to me. Jenny, however, was wired differently, and I had come to terms with that. I always tried to shield her from her vulnerabilities. Now I plan to leverage my knowledge against her. Exposing her actions to a select group of her friends, family, and acquaintances would devastate her. Why hold back? I've never been one for half measures, so why start now? Every single one of her friends, family, and associates would witness the true Jennifer Brown. At my usual time, I headed home. Yes, I got reprimanded for smoking a cigar. Yes, I was informed that I would be punished by being denied conjugal rights for the next week. Excellent. One week taken care of, five more to go. Six months later, a banquet was held in honor of our anniversary. Twenty-five years of marriage. Everything was expensive and eye-catching. I spared no money for this event. I had my specialists assess Simon's injuries and provide a more accurate estimate for rehabilitation and physiotherapy costs. With that information, my insurance company made him an offer, which he accepted. The last time I saw him, he still hadn't heard anything from Jenny. If I were to be generous, I'd say she was upfront with him about it just being a physical relationship, but frankly the guy was injured and she clearly didn't care. Speaking of Jenny, she was thriving tonight. She moved from person to person like a bee from flower to flower, the center of attention. Among the eleven members of her extended family present, she had the grandest house and took pleasure in showing it off. It's something else I indulged her in over the years. You'd think she achieved it on her own rather than through my efforts. Lately, I've come to realize how little recognition she's given me over the years. She has a tendency to amplify her contributions to our life while downplaying mine. It's funny the things you notice when the lens of love is removed. I glanced around the room, taking note of the attendees. Nearly every member of the school board was present, save for one, along with most of the senior staff. Our local priest and the bishop had also joined, accompanied by 15 other prominent members of their congregation, all under the watchful eyes of certain senior figures from the local media. Half of the city council attended with their partners, some dressed flamboyantly, while others opted for more formal attire. Every family from our street was represented, though some of the younger attendees came alone, their partners presumably tending to their children. This left only six individuals of significance. My two sons, the eldest accompanied by his wife and the youngest with his girlfriend. At my discreet signal, Sean, the latter, would divert the attention of Jenny's parents during my speech. Although I harbored resentment towards Jenny, her parents were good people who didn't deserve to be embarrassed on her account. 
As much as I desired to see her discomfort, I couldn't bear to inflict it upon her family. Sean met my gaze and I nodded in affirmation. With a nervous gulp, he proceeded to carry out his task. As he disappeared into the crowd, I made my way to the pavilion in the backyard and activated the sound system, capturing everyone's attention. I patiently waited for them to gather closer, glasses in hand, prepared to raise a toast. Jenny approached me, planting a kiss on my cheek and gazing at me with adoration, clearly reveling in the spotlight. I found no reason to postpone the inevitable and simply began my speech. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and honored guests, I wish I could stand before you and claim that the past 25 years of my life have been fulfilling and enriched, thanks to my wife Jenny by my side throughout. However, my upbringing taught me never to deceive. Jenny glanced at me, a mixture of embarrassment and horror crossing her still smiling face, creating an unusual sight. She was starting to realize. I was relieved she was grasping the situation so quickly. Hopefully, her intelligence would intensify her anguish at being exposed. She shook her head at me, silently pleading for me not to reveal what she feared I was about to disclose in front of everyone. I remained unaffected. For someone who had no qualms demonstrating butt plugs to janitors, she seemed surprisingly hesitant about facing a little truth among family and friends. I recently discovered that my beloved wife has been unfaithful to me for some time now. Having an affair with another man without my knowledge or consent. Engaging in activities with him that she has always denied me. Jenny, known for her quick wit and unwavering resolve, realized swiftly that without a prompt rebuttal, she was at risk. With no concrete evidence on my part, it would boil down to her word against mine a scenario where most attendees were more familiar with her than with me. With a swift elbow to silence me at the microphone, she shot me a piercing glare. I'm not sure what twisted game Dave is playing here, folks, but I can assure you that I have always been nothing but loving, loyal, and supportive. Skilled in the art of public speaking, Jenny adeptly scanned the audience. Her speech halted as her eyes fell upon the far right, where Simon was being wheeled in on a wheelchair, a fixture he would occupy for months to come. Her speech came to an abrupt halt, her complexion paling. As Simon approached, he extended an old-fashioned audio tape to me. Taking it, I turned and inserted it into the antiquated sound system connected to the public address system. Jenny appeared dumbfounded as the audio began playing from the point I had cued it to. Simon's voice resounded from the speakers. There was a speech in which her lover described what my wife loved to do in every detail. However, Everything came to an abrupt halt when my wife decided to take control of the audio system. It was quite a spectacle, considering she was wearing high heels and a tight skirt. One should never underestimate the rage of an Irish woman when she feels publicly embarrassed. As if that weren't enough, she proceeded to tear out the wires of the audio system, silencing the sound forever. Turning towards me, her expression was one of pure shock and anger. She had lost all self-restraint in her humiliation, as she yelled, flecks of saliva landed on me. You're nothing but a pitiful excuse for a man, trying to shame me and in the damn process, admitting that you've never had what it takes to satisfy me. Yes, I cheated on you with Simon. Many times, Ginny's face contorted into a grotesque grin. And you know what, Dave? He's not the only man I've had an extramarital relationship with. I would have given you the exact number, but to be honest, at some point I lost count. Do you remember our trip to France for our fifth anniversary, Dave? Do you remember the couple we met, Philippe and Simone? Do you remember how we refused to join you on those World War II battlefield tours? Well, we had a great time. We really had a great time. And you, an ignorant husband, didn't suspect anything. And I've been enjoying life ever since. How pathetic and helpless does this make you, Mr. High-Ranking and Powerful Businessman? At that moment, Jenny halted, perhaps due to a lack of breath. Her chest heaved noticeably, suggesting a possible realization that her infamous temper had just altered her life drastically. It triggered a memory of a quote I once read, something about how we each lead three lives, our public, private, and secret lives. Well, Jenny, in a burst of Irish temper, had inadvertently unveiled her secret life to everyone. She gazed at me, 
likely puzzled as to why her recent outburst didn't surprise me. My grin communicated that I had the upper hand, having outmaneuvered her. I had manipulated her like a skilled musician, exploiting her reflex to retaliate against those who hurt her, without considering the consequences. She scanned the faces of the attentive audience, comprising virtually everyone in the world whose opinion held significance to her. It was in that moment, while locking eyes with me, that she grasped a crucial truth about human connections. Being naive isn't a sin. Trusting others doesn't render you an outcast. However, betraying that trust does. As she turned her gaze back to the disapproving crowd, she noticed some women eager to be the first to offer comfort and stake their claim on me. Trust was paramount in Jenny's world, but from that instant onward, she knew that her trustworthiness had been shattered, leaving those around her to realize they never truly knew her. Heading towards the exit, she appeared terribly alone. Yes, I had orchestrated the entire situation. I was fully aware of how she would react if I triggered certain triggers, leading her to fall into the trap I had meticulously prepared. She had the appearance and temperament of an Irish woman. How did I know Simon wasn't the first? There were two main reasons. Firstly, her insistence that I call her from a landline while I was traveling wasn't a request made six months ago. It had been going on long before cell phones were associated with neurological disorders. Secondly, my new acquaintance Simon informed me. That's what we discussed for 20 minutes at the end of our initial encounter. He revealed that he had once questioned her about why she insisted on such elaborate precautions, and she had jokingly recounted a few close calls she had experienced over the years. Like the time they were caught fooling around in the charity office after hours when the cleaner walked in. Or when I questioned her about a motel bill and she had to quickly come up with a plausible excuse. Or when I unexpectedly returned home and her lover had to hide in the closet. The most amusing part was that after I discovered Simon and began planning, three other people came forward to inform me that she was cheating, or at least it seemed that way. Firstly, the mother of a local school soccer player whose team I generously sponsored worked at a nearby VD clinic and risked her job to provide me with copies of paperwork, proving Jenny's treatment for a recurrence of anal warts. Secondly, the close friend of my eldest son's wife inadvertently inquired about a patient at her clinic sharing the same surname, which led to the discovery that my wife was scheduled for a termination the following week. According to the documents, my wife attributed it to the St. John's wart she was taking to aid her sleep. Was her conscience troubling her? Or did this interfere with her covert use of contraceptive pills? It's difficult to comprehend how she could have concealed an abortion. Lastly, Sean's distressing confession the day after I uncovered his knowledge of his mother's affair. He had been out all night and needed a nearby place to crash. Using the spare key hidden away, he quietly entered his old room only to witness Simon returning to the master bedroom from the bathroom. In the dim light, Sean observed Simon getting dressed and heading downstairs. Ironically, it was Sean's outstretched foot that Simon stumbled over in the darkness, resulting in pain and panic. Scene took his time disclosing this to me as he didn't want to be the cause of further anguish. Indeed, Jenny emerged financially stable from the divorce, but due to the negative publicity and rumors in the community, she had to leave the state to avoid perpetual disdain from the public. This proved to be true. Upon settling in a new location, she began spending extravagantly and gained invitations to join various charity boards. However, soon after, her fellow board members received incriminating documents, leading to her swift removal. She repeated this pattern in subsequent relocations. The last communication I had from her was a drunken phone call a week after yet another scandal. The caller ID showed she was three states away. In a slurred voice, she exclaimed, Dave, haven't I suffered enough? To which I simply replied, Nope, before hanging up. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!